Hi, welcome to Elevate Church. Uh, welcome home to our church family. If you're new with us today, we just want to put out a great big warm welcome. In fact, as a way of saying thanks for joining us today, what we'd like you to do is put first time with your name in the chat box with your name. It will say first time and we will send you a free e-gift. It's our way of saying thank you for introducing yourself to us today. Well, I just want to welcome everybody, whether you're a first time, whether you're joining us uh, from afar, you've been joining in uh, during our uh, live streams during this pandemic, or whether you are a part of our church family, catching our live streams online here in our own home city of Edmonton and area. I just want to say welcome today. It's great to have you here. Well, we just wrapped up a series last week called Rumble Strip. Uh, all of our series, in fact, you can pick up on our elevatechurch.ca website. You can go to our messages page and in there you can find the entirety. So I always encourage you to go through the studies um, we're going to uh, sometimes refer back to them and so we will mention to go back to one of the messages go back to one of the series and catch up on everything that's happening well I'm excited to go into a new message series today we're starting and it's called the good work so we're doing a series called the good work and I pray that these messages will speak into your life and that you will hear the heart of God and that you will be stirred by his spirit so that he can do more in you, so he can do more through you. In other words, he's got to do something in you to be able to get something out of you. Well, God specializes in the ordinary, doesn't he? He specializes with ordinary people. Now, this message series that we're in right now uh, is for those of you who may be down deep inside uh, you, you know you've been created for something special. You know that you've been created uh, to do something eternal, something that matters, something that lasts in your life. And over these next weeks, if you're open to what the Spirit of God would say to you, I believe that God will speak directly into your life. And he will give you the faith to step out and do something that outlasts you. Well, you may look around and you may see ordinary people as you pick up these scriptures, but you will see them do extraordinary things. As I look around at the heroes of faith that have gone before me, as I have been growing up over the years, uh, my wife always says I'm still trying to grow up. Uh, but uh, d d when I look around, I, I, I've seen as I get closer and I see extraordinary things from people, as I get closer to them, I recognize they are ordinary people that God, working through them, has caused them to do extraordinary things. Now, one of the things that we're going to study is this ordinary man named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is a guy who has a, a broken heart. But his broken heart is for the plight of his people. And his situation that he looks on, he has decided that he cannot sit by and do nothing. Somebody has to do something, so it might as well be him. So why don't we go ahead, and we're going to go into the second chapter of Nehemiah, and we're going to read in verse 18. He says, And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me, and also about the king's words, which he had spoken to me. Then they said, Let's arise and build. And so they put their hands to the good work. To the good work. Well, today we're starting a message series called the good work. Today's message I have entitled, Can't Take It Anymore. I can't take it anymore. There's a lot of things that happen in life, and, and I'm not talking about that I, I can't take what's happening to me. It's that I can't take what I see happening around me anymore. So as they began this great good work uh, that we see with Nehemiah, there's a couple of things that, that we're noticing here, and we're going to look at, and we're going to look at in the weeks ahead of how God uh, took this ordinary man named Nehemiah. It's an incredible story from the Old Testament and how he made an extraordinary difference. I know some of you may say that I, I can't make an extraordinary difference. It's just ordinary me. But it takes an ordinary you with the work of God in your life to do extraordinary things. And we, in fact, we have a series we're going to be doing coming up in the months ahead uh, around this area. So Nehemiah. Now, what, what I find amazing about Nehemiah is he wasn't a pastor. He, he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a king. He wasn't a prophet. He wasn't even a warrior. 
In fact, he was an ordinary person and he heard something that broke his heart and crushed his spirit and he said something had to be done about it. He wanted to make a difference in the world around him. Now we are at a stage in our church right here uh, where we are being torn between different factors. Uh, we are a new church that had just begun to make its way to make an influence in our community and we were hit by this world pandemic. It's, it's come in the midst of everything and it's just really stopped, not just ourselves, but many churches just dead in their tracks. We've been doing this good work. We've been working on his mission, building the church of Jesus. And, and, and all this stuff happens. In fact, one of the things with our economy right now is that we are at our all-time unemployment high here in Alberta. People have grown accustomed, we know now, to a lack of physical contact, a lack of physical intimacy. Our world is learning how to manage without true in-person community. And I, and I just want to say that there's a reason that the scripture refers to do not forsake the gathering with one another. There's an importance of coming together in person. It's when you can cry together, you can shout together, you, 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 you can touch one another's life so much different. Virtual is, is a wonderful medium to be able to communicate and to share knowledge, but it's not personal. It doesn't have the same relational touch. Some have lost jobs, some have lost their careers, businesses, uh, some have lost loved ones, and some have many friends or family who have experienced really critical highs in mental health concerns during this period of time. But as things really slowly open up in the weeks and the months ahead, that's why at Elevate Church we are searching right now uh, to a building. We are looking for a facility and we are looking for something even with limited funds. And I ask that you would remember even this message today and revert back and, and just to remember us in prayer. Uh, remember us and, and pray as, as God's continually leading us. We're looking for stability for a place that we can set foot uh, as in the weeks and the months ahead as we come out of things and begin to gather and, and, and really create the influence and impact our communities once again. We want to create a place where we can mobilize really as an army, where we can fight together, where we can be a hospital for the wounded, uh, where we can heal the brokenhearted. We, we pray that we could create an environment uh, for a place that we can be a family, what we can call home. But it takes a good work. Would you agree? Just type in good work in your text, in your chat, on your YouTube channel, on your Facebook Live. But it's the work of building Jesus' church. Everybody needs Jesus. But everybody also needs a home. And so today, as ordinary people, there's nothing special about us as a church. Uh, we are just Jesus-loving people who want to share the same uh, incredible news and same love that was given to us. That's what we're about. We're all about Jesus and his word. Okay, well, let's get back to Nehemiah. He was an ordinary guy, and he, if you don't know what he did for a living, he was a cupbearer. He was a cupbearer to the king of Persia. So the king of Persia had him as a cupbearer. Now you may say, what in the world, Evan, is a cupbearer? Well, in our words, we might call them or refer to them as a servant. We might refer to them as a butler. That might be something that we might call them. Uh, it might be an equivalent, possibly. But a cupbearer had a trusted role. It was more than you could even explain today because if you could imagine the cupbearer had tremendous access to the king so if the king's having a private conversation and the king is saying listen you know we're going to be planning to attack so and so and we're, we're going to take the our strategy to they would overhear these conversations they were going to hear conversations the king would say if he says i don't like what's happening in this area of the kingdom right now he's going to know and the cupbearer was going to hear information that was confidential. Now, this guy, this, this, this guy, uh, ne Nehemiah, would have been very trustworthy because a king would not have him be his cupbearer unless he is trustworthy. He'd have to be full of integrity. He'd have to be loyal uh, to the king himself because the title of his job would actually reveal the most important thing of a cupbearer. Now, if you can imagine, uh, in this time of history, now, even today, there, there's plots in all parts of the world uh, to overthrow kingdoms, to overthrow governments. And sometimes people would try to even attempt in those ancient days to take the life of the king. Well, a cupbearer would do, among other things, 
exactly what it says is that he would actually drink the cup so he would take the wine to see if it was poisoned or not so he put his life on the line for the king now i don't know about you but uh uh i if i'm the guy that's tasting the wine and i'm i'm wanting some job security here <laughs> hopefully there's some real benefits that come with this because it doesn't sound they have the ear of the king uh, it doesn't sound like much of a benefit when i could be uh lose my life in a moment's notice by drinking something that was poison uh but this guy was an ordinary person nehemiah was ordinary he, he there was nothing different that stood out about this guy uh when he became a cupbearer but one day on one ordinary day, he hears a conversation from someone that moves him to a place he had never been. So I'm going to take you back, chapter 1 and verse 2. Now it says, Then Haniah, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And this is what Nehemiah does. He says, I asked them about the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. So he's curious, he's, he's trying to learn. And there's a conversation between Nehemiah and his brother. And, and, it, and he, he's asking him, he's saying, tell me about our people. What's going on? Tell me about our homeland. Now, the reason Nehemiah is asking about this is because 140 years prior to this moment, back in, eight, in, 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 in 586 B.C., and by the way, that's before Christ, not before COVID. Uh, the Babylonians are under the rule of the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, who attacked the Jewish people and completely demolished their city, their life, their culture. Uh, and it, it, it's so difficult to describe what had happened to Nehemiah's people. Now, if you've ever heard of Solomon's temple, it was gone. It was wiped away. That had been something that David had wanted to build for so long that was saw through, but it is gone. It's burned to the ground. Every building is now rubble. And the gates to the city, which formed the protection, they were burned. Almost everything that they knew. People were without jobs, without any kind of a hope. And the Babylonians took them captive, took them away from their homeland, and kept them in bondage for a long time. I encourage you to go check out our nine-week series on Unshakable. It's the story of Daniel, and you'll hear all about this story that we're just referring to. But if you could imagine, the Jewish people were demoralized. They felt completely helpless. They, they have no homeland. But now, now, now decades later, 50,000 Jews now move back to Jerusalem to rebuild. And they're going to rebuild the city that they love. They're going to rebuild their homeland. They're, they're going to try uh, to make a better future for themselves. But the problem is they couldn't get anything moving. And they found themselves stalled in a complete dead end. And that's where his brother continues to speak to Nehemiah. Now in first chapter and verse 3. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. In other words, no wall, no gates. There's absolutely no protection from outside forces that will be, be, uh, would be attacking. And they will be pillaged without protection. It was going to be impossible to rebuild they already had no jobs, no economic system. Uh, they, they had no leadership, no direction, no confidence whatsoever. And with no protection, they have no plan, they have no hope. What do you do when you see something that breaks your heart? What do you do when you see something that breaks your heart? Uh, and, and you know there is a good work that needs to be done to make a change. What do you do? What do you do when you see something that bothers you so deeply and you can't take it anymore? Well, I want to give you three thoughts about how to begin your good work. The first thing that we see Nehemiah do, and, and, and we end up doing at some point in our life, and let me give you the first one, is to sit down and cry. It's to sit down and to cry. You know, you, you sit down and, and let whatever it is, the injustice of the world, and just allow it to break your heart. Just allow it to break your heart. Listen to this, Nehemiah 
uh, 1, 4. I'm going to read you the first part of the verse. It says, now when I heard these words, he says, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. He sat down and he wept. You need to sit down and you need to cry when something breaks. In other words, he says, when I heard about the devastation, the hopelessness, I was crushed and I sat down and I began to weep. This guy is, I want you to remember something here. This is not a guy that is with his people right now. He's not sitting in ruins. He's not feeling hopelessness. It's his people who feel hopelessness. What I'm talking today about is not about when you rise up and you fight back the system because you're being suppressed. I'm talking about this is a man, Nehemiah, an ordinary man that has no worries. He is eating with a king. He is in a good place. And I'm telling you, there are many people, as you read about in the scriptures, they're in a good place, but God calls them to do a good work. And just because things are good, just because things are smooth, just because you have a job, just because it doesn't make a difference. If anything, you are called to do the good work. Now, if you're in that plight, do the good work. Still fight. But I want to show you a man who was ordinary and did not need to fight. But he chose to fight because he allowed this to break him. So he sat down and he weeped, not for himself, but for others. You got to remember, he's been watching the same shows as the king. You know, if, if it was in today's world, he'd be doing selfies with the king. You know, it'd be um, hashtag blessed to serve because his life is good. Everything is good except the potential to 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 drink poison. <laughs> the guy is living an incredibly comfortable life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes in my comfort, I can be kind of scrolling through, you know, as, as, as I'm working through my phone and I'll read something on my Twitter feed or somewhere on Instagram or I'm, I'm, I'm on a site and I'm going through and I'm reading and I'm feeling for people. And, you know, I say a, a prayer for them. God, you know, may you be there with them. May you strengthen them. May you provide for them. You know, but, but the truth is, the truth is, is sometimes my, my heart doesn't ache. It, it, it's in my head, but it's not in my heart. I haven't transferred it over yet, you know, to the point where it bothers me enough. But what happened to Nehemiah, he's bothered enough to stir him. It drove a deep burden for what he heard about his people. And I'm telling you, as a church at Elevate, it drives us to know about the broken people that are without Jesus the families that are breaking and those that are dying without hope, those that are in addiction, those that are struggling day to day. Like there, there is hope and hope is found in him. Hope is found in him. But do you pray for the brokenness? Do you pray for the brokenness of people and what's happening in the plight of their life, uh, of the struggles? Or do you just go, oh man, I feel bad. But you don't sit down and you don't cry. You don't cry for them, you know? May, what what is it? it are, are you crying out for those who have been trafficked is, is, is it break your heart what breaks your heart you know is, is it the person who's been bound by an addiction does it break your heart someone who can't meet their needs month to month and they struggle a place where there's abuse happening does that break your heart does it break your heart to see people that that are so angry at the church that they turn away from god does that break your heart? Does it break your heart that people don't have a, a passion and a, and a desire to fulfill his mission, but yet Jesus came to set us free? He came to, 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 to give us a chance at an everlasting family, a forever family, to be a part of that? Does that break your heart that people are just rejecting it? But for the children, see, one of the things for me is when I look at children, I come from a broken family, and I'm not even feeling broken for the parents. I feel broken for the children because I've been there. I've experienced it. I know what it feels like. And, and so when I see children, what they have to go through, it breaks my heart. And many times I'll sit and I'll cry. That was one of the things that took me into ministry when I saw the things that were happening in families. And I said, God, you have something so much better in your word. I want to share it. I want to take it. We move from working just with youth and just with children to beginning to actually working with families in whole and pastoring our own work. But let me tell you a story. Many years ago, uh, I, somebody came to church, and I remember I, I, I was fairly new 
as, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus. And, and, and someone came to church. Now, they came in pretty short, cut off jeans. They had a halter top on uh, with just like a, a little shawl kind of wrapped around it. They came in, lots of makeup. As they came in, you, you could tell that they were feeling very nervous. But I saw them as they got to the front door. And one of the guys that was at the front door just said, well, excuse me, ma'am. You know, here in our church, we, we, we dress our best to show reverence for the Lord. We're, we're dressing in our best for God every Sunday. And I saw her jaw drop and turn around. And it was almost like tears in her eyes. She wanted to get away as fast as she could. She had been, been humiliated. Jesus says, come as you are. And one of the things that, as I saw from that moment, it talked to me about the relevance of the church. You know, no perfect people allowed in church. No perfect people allowed. I mean, the, the, the story, it, it became quite simple for me. I knew that one day if, if I ever had a chance, and even as my wife and I talked in the years ahead as we began to look at possibly leading our own work, I mean, I, it became that we're going to have a dress code. <laughs> it's going to be simple. Just please put something on. <laughs> Just put something on. But that's not the God that I serve. He says, who's ever thirsty, let him come. Who's ever thirsty, let him come. Well, I want my heart to be tender, so I want it to break. But I also need to kneel down to pray. Nehemiah kneeled down to pray. Now listen to me, church. It's not just a big enough thing just to cry about it. It's even bigger when you could kneel down and pray. You know, sometimes people say, we've done all we can. Let's pray. Are you serious? We've done all we can, and then we pray? No, we should be praying and say, we've now prayed, now let's stand. Let's stand upon the prayer that we've already put out. I mean, you imagine God saying, it's down to me? Uh, buddy, it's been about me from the very beginning. Now let me take you to the latter half of Nehemiah 1 and now in that verse 4. And then he went on and continued and says, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. God plus one, it's always a majority. It's always a majority. <laughs> Nehemiah cries out to God. He's, he, he, he's just like, he said, before God. I was praying and fasting before God. Let's go to verse five now in Nehemiah one. It says, I said, please, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps the covenant and faithfulness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Please, Lord God of heaven. He's requesting, he's making his request known. And if you watch Nehemiah's prayer, and if you read on, he confesses his own sin, of, of, and then he confesses the sins of his people. And he reminds God of God's promises and God's faithfulness. Now, now get this. I know God's sovereign in some of you. What is he reminding them for? God doesn't need reminded. That's wrong. But listen to this. It's not to remind God. God knows what he is. It's to remind himself of the promises that God had said. So as he prays, it's a form of communication, of connection. It's nothing like reassuring when you're saying, I know, honey, that you made a promise to love me. And to... It's because sometimes you need to hear that for yourself and you need to put that deep down into your thoughts. But if you watch his prayer and you read on, he confesses. And after he's mourned and after he's fasted and after he prays, he now goes before the king and asks for permission. See, he, he asks for permission to now be able to go back to what's broken his heart and to begin to rebuild. Let's continue now in verse 11 of the first chapter. Please, Lord, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. Listen to this. And please make your servant successful today and grant him mercy before this man. Who's this man? The king. Remember, Nehemiah has come to him. He's an ordinary man, an ordinary day, but he has become burdened. It's broken his heart, what he has seen. And he says, now I was the cupbearer to the king. You got to understand. He says, now I was the cupbearer. And we, we now know what a cupbearer is. I hope you understand that what you pray about reflects what you believe. Your belief system is reflected in your prayers and how you communicate to God. If, you, if your only prayer is blessing the food and saying, keep me safe, God, you know, and, and, and give me a good day, God. And, you know, 
That means you don't really believe in a powerful God. You don't really believe in a powerful God that can stretch you. You don't believe in a powerful God that can use you, ordinary you, to do extraordinary things for him. Your prayer is reflecting what you believe about God. Nehemiah actually prayed about 12 prayers that, that he prays in the book of Nehemiah. These are ones we know about. I, there, there are surely hundreds more that we don't know, but it's the first. He begins his story, the middle of his story, and the end of the story, he is praying as he goes before God. And that's our job. As we go before God as an individual, what, what, one thing at Elevate, what is it that God's put on your heart? Because as God brings you into the fold, as you become a part of our community, of our family, uh, as you become a part of what Elevate is, God has put something on your heart, and we want to work together. We want to give you that chance. We want to launch you into the good work that God is calling you to because it's all a part of fulfilling the mission that God has called us to. So what is that on your life? Because the thing you're going to need to do is to find what breaks you, and then you need to begin to pray and pray. It's in your faith and your prayer. What we're going to see, by the way, is that Nehemiah is a leadership guru. This guy, in, in the way he leads, he is practical in every way. So I want you to think about this. He st literally, he studies, he strategizes, he casts vision, he delegates. He's a guru, but yet everything he does is with faith and prayer. It's with faith and prayer. So how do you begin the good work when you just can't take it anymore? You begin the good work when you just can't take it anymore. How do you do it? You begin to let God, what's ever breaking you, and you sit and you let it minister to you. And by the way, if nothing is breaking you, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. See, that's what the enemy, if the enemy can't stop you, he'll paralyze you. He'll keep you in a place of fear or he'll keep you in a place of comfort because you need to know this. Your calling is not in the comfort. Your calling is out here. Your comfort is not behind something. It's out front. That's your calling. And God is calling you to a greater mission than what is set before you. Something must break you. And if it does not, you need to get before God. Oh, search my heart, oh God. Break me. Find me. Help me see what I need to see. What is it that moves your heart? But number three, you need to stand up and act. This is where he asked for permission and did something about it. So you need to stand up and act. So what do you do? You sit and you cry and you weep and you mourn for what you're broken with. But then you begin to pray and then you begin to stand and you begin to act. So Nehemiah takes the cup to visit the king. You got to remember his heart is heavy and the king can tell. All right, in Nehemiah now, and this is in chapter two and in verse four. Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said to the king, remember that, by the way. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, I request that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it, that I may rebuild it. Now, it's like a flare prayer. You know, he says, okay, what do you need? And he says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. And then he made his request. He made sure he kept setting them out there constantly. He's saying, listen, my people are hurting, King. The walls are down. The city is exposed. And I can't sit and do nothing anymore. Somebody has got to do something, and it might as well be me. Stand up and act. Today, Elevate Church, as we move into these next weeks and months, are you ready to stand and act? Are you ready to find what breaks your heart? Are, are, are you ready to pray and to fast? Are you ready to stand up and act and take action? Be a part of the team. You know, I always love the team together. Everyone accomplishes more team, you know. There is no I in team. <laughs> it's all about being a part of, of such a bigger family. My wife and I, 30 years ago, we wanted to start a church. Uh, we had no money. We had no plan. Uh, we had no pat. We, we, all we had was passion. And, and, and the, the toughest thing when we began to look and we began to try to just say, why would we do this? 
and we remember the brokenness when we remembered the people's lives at various junctions of our life. We had so badly wanted to build a church that they would want to be a part of. A place where people would say yes to Jesus. A place to call home. A place where they'd be loved regardless. A place that would make sense where they could live out their faith and their life and converge it together to build that kind of a church. And and, and that became our mission. We wanted to make that hospital, that army, that community, that place. But we were scared to death. You know, we were like, God, give us a sign. And we weren't sure. And we, we, it was weeks and months and we prayed and we were heading in a direction. We we're getting some education along the way. And, and it was, was really through a period of time as we were broken and we prayed and broken and prayed. But we took action steps. We didn't know where we were going next. And then all of a sudden, God began to put the pieces together. And it didn't happen just once, but it happened the second time when we did this again. We never thought we would plant another church after that first one. But we did it again. And we did it because God showed us something that broke our hearts. And we wanted to build a church that could touch the lives of the people here in this region. But you got to let it in. You got to let the pain in. You got to let it wreck you. You know, perhaps you're just like Nehemiah. You're an ordinary person. You know, and to every extent you have been chosen by God. And he wants you to start a good work. Father, stir up within us, God. Break some hearts that we might act on your behalf. God, show us. Help us. God, I pray that those, even right now this week, you would reveal to them as they reach out to you to to begin to examine and begin to look quicken to their minds the things that break their heart and then as they begin to search you father give them the strength to stand to stand and to act to do the good work because we just can't take it anymore father i pray in the weeks ahead even as we pray to to re to relaunch the church back into its place uh, in its rightful place within our city and within our communities. Uh, Father, as we are taking new stands and believing for new jobs and new influence over these next weeks, God, show us the things, God, that would break our heart, that would matter to us, God. It's each person seeks to find that from you. Lord, would you show them? And Father, anyone that would be with us here today, I pray for those that are feeling lonely even at this time that feels so separated from you. And if that's you and you're, you're following with us today, I just want to let you know, Jesus loves you. God loves you so much, but Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. See, because you were separated for the things that you've done wrong in your life called sins. They separated you from that perfect picture, that, 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 the, the best life that God has for you, and that's with him. He's called you to be a part of a forever family. And if today you can't say for certain you're a part of that forever family, the part of the Christian family, all it takes is to accept and ask for forgiveness so that the Lord can forgive your sins. See, Jesus died in your place. He left. He came. He was tempted in every way. Paid the price on that cross for you. He was the lamb that was slain. Instead of an animal to be killed every time someone sinned, once and for all, he would pay the price. But he had to live the life we lived. And he came to earth. He did that. He paved the way and he sent a helper to comfort you now uh, through the next steps of your life. Would you accept Jesus today? Father, I thank you for sending your son. Jesus, thank you for dying on that cross. But I ask that you would, Lord, today forgive me for everything that I have done wrong. And I ask that you would guide my steps in the next ways. I am so wanting to leave my past life behind. And so today I repent. I do a 180 and I change the direction of my life. And today I trust you. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I, I want to encourage you uh, to be able to share this message today. If you have not already, uh, you can send it through our YouTube click. Send people to our messages uh, page uh, through our website. You can go right through on our Facebook page. And you can be able to let others know. Uh, I encourage you. It's the easiest way 
It's the simplest way. It's just using your social media as an outlet to be able to share the great news of Jesus. Let's impact other people's lives. It's all a part of the good work. Let it break you. Amen. Well, I also just want to thank you. I want to thank you for your faithfulness and your giving. We are in a search, and I ask that you would continually be praying as we look for a facility. It's not cheap. It's not easy. We don't have the funds that are being asked for the places that we're trying to find that would work appropriately for us. Uh, we are still looking what areas we can go into because of costs and or the best places for outreach. Um, so during this time with limited dollars, pray that God would increase uh, what we're able to do, give favor, and find the right place. So I'm trusting that you guys will do that this week. Well, I just want to say thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, God bless you. Uh, make sure that you plan to be with us next week. So our live stream is running currently right now at 7 p.m. on Sundays. Make sure you join us live if you're able to. If not, you've caught this post. Uh, we hope to see you live next week. Uh, in the meantime, just have a wonderful and a blessed week, guys. God bless.